like to thank the organizers for the invitation for us to be here today. Mr. Porter and myself serve as the faculty advisors for this Baja Racing organization. And what I'm going to be presenting today is a little bit about the story, about the organization, about the big picture of the organization, and then Mr. Porter is going to share with you some of the details of the day-to-day -day operation of the organization. And some of the, the experience that we had this year, uh, part of the organization is uh, basically for racing a mini Baja vehicle or a Baja vehicle, and we go to an international competition every year. So he's going to share with you some of the, the pictures and some of the, the exciting adventures that we had over there. This organization, the Baja organization, Baja Racing organization is part of the, the UTPA chapter for the Society of Automotive Engineers. And uh, a little bit about uh, the story of the Baja Racing is that uh, in 2000, actually in 1999, Dr. Rajiv Nambiat, who is now head of the Manufacturing Engineering Department, was looking for a way to involve students in designing a product from the beginning to the end and giving them the experience of coming up with a real product. And he came up with this idea of involving the students into this international competition, the international BACA competition. He did this for three years until the 2001. And in 2001, I joined the university. And when I first came in, he, he asked me to, to see if I could take over the organization. So I expanded the, a little bit the, the vision. In 2002 was my first year as the, the advisor for the, for the organization. And I was expanding a little bit. I, I quickly realized that uh, this was uh, a gold mine in, in different ways. In, 2002, in 2001, when I joined the, in the mechanical engineering department, the department had 200 students. We, we currently have more than 600. And, and in part of that is because of some of these activities where the students get connected with the department. So a little bit about the, the, the history, and honestly I'm going to spend a lot of time, but uh, in 2003 we actually had, after some uh, recruitment of female students, we actually have an all-female team that actually competed. So in 2003 we had a, a two cars actually that took the competition, and one of the cars was from a group of all female students. And actually, the driver, Ariana, was one of the best drivers that we have ever had. She was a very aggressive driver. <laughs> and she was a very good driver. <laughs> so, <laughs> for, from, and she was a very good driver. Let's, let's give it a shot. So from that, we've been participating in the competition every year. And nowadays, we actually have combined things. We don't necessarily try to separate males and females, uh, students. We actually have combined teams. And actually, we see that that's better for, for our kids. So year after year, we have different teams of students. And uh, we go and design new vehicles. And then we go and compete. And a little bit about the story here, year to year. 2010, we have had, uh, that was the year where we had our best performance ever. We placed in the top 15% of the, the, the groups or the, in the competition. Have in mind that we usually compete with more than 100 teams from the US, Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil. There are teams that come from all the way from India. And uh, Saudi Arabia also competed recently. So it's a very top competition. The other, the other thing that you need to have in mind is the budget. Usually, and, and Mr. Potter is going to talk a little bit about the budget, but usually we have a very small budget compared to other schools. So the students really have to be creative. And they're not competing on a playing field when they're going to compete over there. And uh, it's very amazing the results that they can get with what they're, they're giving to compete with. Now, uh, back in 2011, the competition was very close to jumping Missouri. I don't know if you remember, but that, that year it was when uh, a tornado hit the, the community there. And we were very close to that place. And something that the students did was actually they make a collection here of food and, and water to take over there. Now, 
at the time, I didn't think it was a very good idea because we were driving more than 800 miles to get there. So it was going to be easier just to collect money and take it there. But they wanted to collect the food and, and the water. And they were very surprised when we got there and we got all these supplies, a trailer with supplies. The people over there were surprised and moved with these students that wanted to take food from, from, from the valley, from the Rio Grande Valley, all the way over there. 2013 and 2014, also very good years for us. And we recently attended uh, the competition in Alabama. And, uh, and we just came from the competition, and Mr. Porter is going to share a little bit more about uh, that competition. You brought your dog? I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a public relations officer. <laughs> and he's very good at it. We get all the teams coming and saying hi to the dog first. <laughs> but uh, a little bit about the competition. So basically the competition consists of uh, submitting some reports. Basically, you need to submit the safety reports about the frame, all the details about the frame, design report, cost report. Then you have to make a business presentation there about your vehicle. Then we have dynamic events. There are static events as well, but then dynamic events. Hill climb, maneuverability, suspension, acceleration, and then a four-hour endurance test. This is an overall picture. Then you're going to get the actual pictures from the competition from this year. Now, what I want to highlight before I give uh, Mr. Porter the opportunity to share some of those pictures is that uh, the reality is about the students and about creating opportunities for the students. This is one of the first groups of students that uh, we sent to competition. And it was clear since the beginning that it was about making sure that the students had opportunities when they graduate. Now, as a side benefit, there is a strong connection with the students. By the time that they graduate, they are following up with us about the teams and what is happening. And some of them actually showing competition. They actually, once we're there in competition, they the alumni start coming to competition to visit us and to support us. So, and the other thing that is important here is about inspiring new, new generations. And, and at, at the beginning, if you remember one, it was mentioned before in the previous presentation that something that we're trying to do is attract more female students to the STEM areas. Well, this project provided an opportunity to attract students. And uh, actually, because of that, actually, the second year that we were doing that, we were able to create an all-female all team. But we have had a lot of students in the lab just coming and uh, hearing the story about the, the organization and getting inspired. And, uh, and I can show you pictures after pictures after, after pictures of all the groups that come to the lab and look at the car. They want to take pictures inside of the car and uh, just spend some time there in the lab looking at all the things that we have here. So with, without further ado, I'm going to let you see the, the pictures from the competition this year. Now, uh, before I get into all the, uh, the, the, the full presentation, I'd like to uh, Second, what Dr. Fuentes was talking about, where we're trying to build future generations of engineers here. So we're trying to uh, create an atmosphere that is going to be akin to what they're going to see when they graduate and they get a job, they get that dream job at an automotive company. Uh, by the way, a lot of our uh, Baja members graduate and work for automotive companies such as GM or Toyota. Uh, we have quite a few uh, Pan Am students, uh, engineering graduates that work at the Toyota plant in San Antonio. I've, I go there, I visit there every summer to see our interns' presentations. It's a really cool place. They give tours if you're interested in that kind of thing. It's a really fun place to visit. Uh, but we try to create our team uh, structure that would mimic the structure in a manufacturing environment uh, where we have uh, sub-teams that are actually working on different subsystems of the car. Uh, steering, uh, 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 suspension, drivetrain, uh, ev even aesthetics, uh, uh, which, is, which is exactly how the car industry actually works it all out. Uh, so we decided this year we wanted to uh, create a structure of, of team that was, wasn't just a captain and him just telling everybody what to do. 
So what we did is we made a bunch of uh, a bunch of captains where we have one captain in charge. They have a a board meeting every every week to decide what their goals are that week and work together as a team that way. And then they go off on their separate ways. Excuse me, and they do their own thing in their separate subsystem. And and it's really worked well for us. I think we're on an upward climb right now. Uh, so be looking forward to seeing even better results than what I'm about to show you in the future. So. First, we start with design. We've got to, we use SOLIDWORKS, we use Al Gore. Uh, we, we're trying to learn a, 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 a software program called uh, Atoms. It's uh, used to dynamically uh, design and analyze your entire car system, uh, your suspension system and everything. So we, we've got a lot of work to do, but we, we do our due diligence, I think, in design. You can see on the left-hand side is the poster that we used. I apologize for the horrible picture, but uh, that's the poster that we used in the design presentation up at the competition. And it shows the, and, and the analysis that we did on the frame, on the suspension system, on the brake system, uh, and on the gears themselves. We actually took our gearbox apart. We got each gear, and we said, how can we make this gear lighter? And when we got our result, uh, we actually had gears that didn't break. The, the, in fact, the student that designed these gears on the way to Alabama told me that if, if a gear broke, he was going to walk home. <laughs> and I, I bugged him about that the whole trip. What if the gear breaks, Joseph? What if the gear breaks, Joseph? No gears broke. We had, he, he had a nice, easy drive, ride home with the rest of us. Now, on the right-hand side, you see our, uh, the calculations that we have to do. This is the handwritten version of a sheet that we turn in for the competition that we're really doing a lot of engineering calculations for uh, frame design and showing that the safety of our frame is, is, uh, is adequate. So we go through construction. This is where we start. We start by building our frame. This is where we end up with a complete car that we can test and then modify before competition, hopefully, if we find some flaws. This is car number 22 that we took to Alabama and our teammates uh, surrounding it. It was a really pretty car. Uh, we're very proud of our, of our students and our car this year. So I'll show you a few more pictures. Yes, I did take my dog. My dog is named Grizzly. He is our PR captain as well as our mascot. He's been to Tennessee as well as the Alabama competition. I've been to three competitions. He's been to two competitions. And the competition where I didn't take him, I missed him so bad, I've, I've pretty much uh, decided to take him every time now. Now, this is the car after the four-hour endurance race. Just to give you an idea of the grueling uh, trials that this car sees during that four-hour endurance race, this is the site map that we were given. I don't know where the pointer is on this thing. But if you can see the picture on the top part of the map, there's a blue path that goes around and it wiggles around a lot. That is the four-hour endurance race path. It's a two-mile course, and it's about a mile from one end of the course to the other. So you can imagine how much walking we had to do during the competition just to see the different events. You're talking about walking a quarter mile to see the next event or maybe a half mile to see the next event. This is the University of Alabama, or, uh, of Auburn in Alabama, in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, I took a couple of pictures of the campus. That's the best one I had, so I decided to show you all that one. That's the engineering complex. And on the left-hand side is something I really would love to bring to Pan Am, a trophy case full of trophies. That's, that's, that's our goal, really, is to show these students that well, they, when they apply their engineering skills and really do it right, they can bring home trophies and put UTPA on the map, future UTRGV on the map. This is our sales presentation team. That's why we were on the campus. We went for the sales presentation there. They had to give a Shark Tank style presentation to, uh, to basically pretend investors. Uh, that They had to uh, give a presentation on production and manufacture uh, from scratch. Uh, in, in other words, they had to design the facility, the, the process, and everything to design the car for 4,000 units per year. And our team did a great job at Caesar and Ben. 
we practiced on the way over. I drilled them to death, and we did a really great job in the sales presentation. This is the, the actual competition grounds. This is the, the, the wooded path that you had to walk down to get to the paddocks area, which is what you see on the right-hand side. And the paddocks area is what everybody else thinks of as the pit area, where you can work on and fix your car. In the pit area in our race, all we can do is put gas and change drivers, and that's it. You can't work on your car. You have to take it back to the paddocks area. This is an inspection. Every car has an engine inspection to make sure the engine runs right, and then we also have a safety inspection for the frame to make sure that the driver is safe uh, inside the car. Uh, SAE is very particular about their safety rules. They've got a, uh, we've got a rule book literally like t uh, an inch or two thick that we have to comb through every year to make sure that we're not breaking any, any safety rules. Uh, more, engine ins uh, more inspection, we have tech inspection where they uh, uh, inspect the car for safety. Now the endurance, I've got some, some pictures to show you all. I think I may save those for the end if I have time. Uh, these are our sponsors. It's very imp I wanted to get to our sponsors because we couldn't do this without sponsors. We really couldn't. Our team works tirelessly all year doing fundraising. We just had a barbecue in the quad today. Uh, we were selling chicken tacos. Uh, if you want the email that gives you the, 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 the news that, uh, in the future, you can go to our website. It's uh, uh, Baja Racing, uh, UTPA Baja Racing com. We're also available on Facebook. You can Facebook us also. We take donations, big and small. Uh, but our biggest donors, we, all, uh, we get uh, stickers on the car as well. This is the banner that we had hang, hanging at the competition uh, so that all, everybody that went by our paddocks area knew that we had sponsors that helped us get to where we're at. Um, now, just to, just to get to the results, because I know you're wondering how we did. Uh, first of all, overall, had, we did 22nd. 22nd out of 82 compet compete, uh, competition cars. Now, I say 82 cars, but they're actually like 100 and something registered for the event. Some of them were weeded out before the event even started because they didn't qualify to, to get in, whether their design wasn't uh, passed or uh, they weren't able to, to, to pass any, any one of the inspections, the engine inspection or the technical inspection brake inspection, where they have several things they need to pass before they can even compete. The endurance race, we, did, we made 25th, which is pretty good com considering what kind of schools we're competing with. Suspension 20th, hill climb 29th, maneuverability 29th, acceleration 18th, cost presentation 23rd, uh, which by the way, the cost presentation, this was the second year that we had this at our competition. It's a new thing at the competition. So I was pretty proud of my team that we, put, we were able to be in uh, as high as 23rd. And unfortunately, our design presentation was the lowest. So we have some work to do, obviously. Now, uh, before I get to questions, do I have time to show some pictures of the competition? Okay. Endurance first. So some action shots here. Now you can do try to put your thumb down. Yeah. I'll just go through them, give you a second to look at each picture. I think some of them speak for themselves. How fast are they are the Baja's running? The Baja car it will go about thirty five to forty miles an hour depending on the surface it's on. We have to use a standard 10 horsepower Briggs and Stratton engine that SAE provides. All we have to do is pay for the shipping for it to get here. We get a new engine every two years. How do you sign up to be a driver? You are the smallest person on the team and you're brave. <laughs> yeah, pile up. That's the start of the race right there. They stack them up six in a row, and we were like third row. We did pretty good on the acceleration test. We were 18th to start the race. That's number 22. That's us. So I've got a question on. I've got a question on. Um, obviously, you do a lot of engineering on the vehicle before it goes out there. But what type of data are you collecting 
while the vehicle is running or from the course. You all have sensors on the vehicle that's showing you any you know shot data or or power data or anything like that that's coming back real time to you guys. Well, no. Uh, that's something we actually aim to work on in the future. We want to get some electric. We're actually working on a senior design project right now, uh, designing a, the, a new gearbox that will have some sensors, some shock sensors on it, some vibration sensors on it, so we can monitor the gearbox. Uh, we're also looking to add some electronic sensors to uh, to monitor the gas level, because right now we're pretty much guessing when we need a pit stop. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, we would like to be able to drive as long, you know, uh, drive our tank empty, in other words, and, and have as a few driver changes as possible. So can we go to the other, other folder? But are you, during the race, are you all able to, to kind of monitor that, or I guess? The, the only sensor that's currently on the car, like a high-tech sensor like you're thinking of, is a transponder. And we have that for the competition itself so that they can keep track of our lap, lap data and they can keep track of our position on the track and that sort of thing. Uh, do we have any other sensors? Can you talk about the communication? Uh, ah, we did invent a new communication system for our driver. Uh, it's pretty simple, really. Uh, we designed a bracket for the steering wheel that would be able to, he would be able to mount his, uh, his, uh, his smartphone on the steering wheel uh, so he could receive texts from us from the, from the paddocks area if we had any updates. And, uh, and he had uh, his Bluetooth earpiece in, so if, if it was a real emergency, he could actually call us from the race. Now, texting isn't really a possibility because, one, you shouldn't text and drive anyway. <laughs> uh, but in a race, you definitely should not text and drive. So texting wouldn't be a possibility. But he could talk to us and, and, uh, and let us know if something happened. Uh, let's say the car broke down and he's not driving. Then he could have his cell phone uh, really available right in front of him. Do any of the drivers have – sorry if I'm taking the phone question. But, uh, <laughs> he, was also using the, he was also using the sensors in the phone to, to track his – his path, and so you uh, can see where he was at on the track as well. But are you all communicating with, the, are any of the drivers communicating back to the pit area yeah. as they're driving? Um, yes, we had, well, we had a radio uh, tied to one of the, the, the support members for the, the steering column, and uh, we were using that to communicate with the driver uh, in an emergency situation, but like as he's driving, it's just too hard for him to grab a radio and hit the button and still drive the car through some of the log areas and stuff you see here are pretty rough, uh, so it's kind of it's kind of hard for, to, for him to communicate while he's racing. But say if he's if, if the car broke down, he can give the the paddocks a, a heads up and tell us to be ready for us when he gets towed back in. L luckily, we didn't have to be towed this year. Uh, we had a couple of <laughs> malfunctions, but we were able to to kind of uh, limp back to the paddocks area. There, well, some of these aren't our cars. <laughs> I'm talking about the four-hour endurance race. We did have a, a, a malfunction uh, while we were uh, while we were like testing before the race, the day before the race. So we did actually have to get towed. There may be a picture in there where we're being towed, uh, but it's not during the four-hour endurance race. Did anyone share any video? I do have video. Uh, Facebook was really slow today for some reason, so I didn't want to risk it. Uh, I don't have the video actually on my own hard drive, so. I was using, I was going to use student uh, a video, and also uh, I'm I'm not allowed to use my laptop on this presentation, so it would be hard for me to show Facebook. But. Well, you saw some of the if you if you want to look at, on my Facebook, my I'm Greg Potter on Facebook, <laughs> friend me, and you can see all the video that I've posted. I've also posted the the video that the Baja team has shared. You can go to the Facebook page of the Baja team as well, UTPA Baja Racing. That is the, the storm that, we, that just barely missed us. So how much money did you uh, raise, or how much money is required for this every year? Our, our budget is about, uh, if we had to buy the, everything on the car from scratch and pay MSRP, it would be about a $15,000 car. And that's without the markup at the dealership, right? Uh, however, we can reuse our parts, like we, use, we reuse the shock absorbers and wheels and tires and things like that so we can save some money there uh, so we're looking at we every year we have to raise about maybe uh, between ten and fifteen thousand dollars 
to afford the parts that we need. Maybe we need some new equipment. And then also, we also have to be able to pay for the trip, which we took 20 people with us this year. Uh, so that's a lot of Happy Meals every time we stop and eat. You guys went in vans? Just in your room? We rented two vehicles, one to pull the trailer with the car in it. Uh, we had one van full of people and my dog. And then we had two personal vehicles that went. The team members took them. It is a air-cooled engine. What is it, the protected or carbureted? The carbureted. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a big lawnmower engine. Does that say you get inside there and check to see if you've got anything like... Yes, they do. The intakes, board strokes? Yeah, you can't pieces. bore the, the piston uh, cylinders out or anything like that. You can't modify the engine in any way. And that, that's, the, one of the first, that's the first check they do is check the engine. Uh, they do an engine inspection and make sure it's running just like the rest of them are running. So we can't do that. Any at all performance improvements you can make to the engine? Not to the engine itself, but we can have a drivetrain that has a transmission and uh, maybe a gear reduction. Or, you know, we can we can work there after after the 10 horsepower, but we can't get more than 10 horsepower, unfortunately, no. Do the rules say you have to have a driver? <laughs> because if you uh, made a remote control, you could lose a lot of weight. Don't you? Well, I know that the rules mention the driver a lot. I don't know if they actually... <laughs> say the you know, driver is required. I'm pretty sure that it is, uh, or somebody would have thought of it. Cornell would have a driverless car by now, I'm sure, if there was no, because they're the one that wins all the time. It's like uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, Cornell, Michigan, those are the ones that win all the time. One of them would have a driverless car by now if it was possible. Why, why, do, they win? why do they win? Partially because uh, they have higher budgets than we do. If you, like, for example, Auburn University was one of the, was, I think they were, no, they were fourth place, I think. Uh, and I asked a, a, a local, what, what's tuition at Auburn University? And he said 15000 a semester. 15000 a semester. So one year at Auburn would pay for my entire undergraduate and graduate career in school, like easily. And I have money left over for a down payment for a car, probably. So it's, it's a matter of budget. Uh, they get they get money from their school. We have to do fundraisers and and find and find sponsors. And and, it, and it, it's it, like uh, Dr. Francis was saying, it's really an unfair playing field that we're on. I guess more specifically, what the question was is, uh, the metals that are used on the car are they lighter than uh, what you're using? And the driver himself, uh, are they hiring like professional drivers? <laughs> No, they're not allowed to hire a professional driver, uh, although the guys in Michigan seem to drive better. I don't know. They're, they're near GM, I think. Maybe that something, has something to do with it. Uh, now, uh, the, the materials, uh, it really boils down, again, to budget. Do we have the budget to buy the equipment necessary, the materials themselves? And we, we really have a... a, a, a where are we going to put the equipment also is another issue that we have. We're running out of room in the engineering department as it is. We're lucky that we have a Baja lab still to, to work in, and it's full uh, of spare parts and uh, Baja frames and whatnot. So uh, one is space, one is budget, uh, like material costs and, and different processes like carbon fiber, uh, aluminum, uh, titanium, those kind of things that are, are, so are really limited on budget. Titanium car, and we've got right. This, well, yeah, okay. yeah, we got chromoly steel, and they're they're using advanced materials like uh, carbon fiber and whatnot. So, gotcha. but let, let me address that uh, because I think it's important to also go back to the point that we can win this. Yeah, it's about creativity. It's, uh, we can win, and, and actually, part of what I, the message that I also wanted to uh, make sure that we convey today is that. We're looking for students and faculty that want to partner. Short little life students. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, but no, we need to go from, right there. from business, from uh, from all the different areas. We need people. We need people. we need students from from physics, from chemistry. Maybe we can actually use materials that we haven't thought about uh, to fiber yeah, fiber reels. Well, so, but, Why don't you work with those guys? But the idea here is we really are trying to represent not only UTRGV, but the South Texas. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and the goal here is also to attract more companies at some point to this region. The whole idea or the vision that we have is 
Basically, we want to make sure that we're in the map. People know where UTRGV is because their, their students are winning competitions, student design competitions. And then more companies will be attracted to this region. Have you, have you talked to Fiber Rio about collaborating with them? Well, the, the issue with the Fiber Rio... Give it more insulation. Well, no, they, they make the, the, the nanofiber uh, materials, which is super light. Mm -hmm. But for, for the application that we have, we're, we're interested in, in other properties in those materials. So for instance, the structural materials, well, we cannot use nanofibers for that. But, we, but maybe, maybe Fiber Rio can actually fund part of uh, our efforts. And, and we haven't really talked to them. Seems that you have a very good partnership with Toyota. Why don't you just try out there what they can provide you with? They have in the they past. Last, last year they gave us five thousand dollars for for the vehicle. So uh, it's, well, it's building material wise. Because apparently you mentioned that you're provided, right? right? Now the, the there's also the 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 issue of the cost report that we have to turn in every year. And we have to we have to tell the the truth about how much everything costs, uh, and everything has to be the MSRP price. So like even if we get something donated to us for free, uh, for example, this year we got uh, a lot of brake parts and spindles, uh, about two thousand dollars worth of parts from an ATV store in Laredo. But we have to write down on the cost report how much each of those things actually costs. And so we have a, we have a budget. Uh, so we have, it's not a cap, but we have to, uh, we have to report it. And the higher our cost report shows our car costs, we get penalized for that. So uh, the cheaper the car is, the better. And what, what, what it really boils down to is we need to buy less parts and manufacture more parts. We can, we can manufacture more pieces to the car if we can get more funding, get more equipment in here to be able to do that. And, and that will save us money in our cost report. I think that's where we're going to uh, uh, gain some ground there on the, on the cost. I have two, two ideas. One is we have a lot of precision manufacturing, like actual companies that do toolings for microbiotics. So I'm wondering if there's any community involvement that could be done. And my other idea was I've been to those, uh, I guess, dirt races that are, um, I guess that's 10th Street. We go, down we go there. practice out there. That was my point is, well, one, you can use it as fundraising opportunity as well as a, I guess you can do like a, I guess between various generations. I would like to invite every one of y'all to send me an email at gpotter uh, at utpa.edu. If you have any fundraising ideas for me, uh, I'll take it because I, I, we've exhausted our own brains on how we can get more donations, more fundraising, more sponsors. And if, if I welcome any idea, uh, we're talking about going to golf tournaments and stuff right before we came over here, you know, so I mean, it, it, any ideas is on the table as far as uh, sponsorship goes and, and that, that money's gonna help us. Now, not only will it help us build a better car, but it may actually help us compete more because there's actually like three or four uh, competitions each year that SAE puts on. We just go to one because that's all we can afford. We can only afford the, the, the one trip, but we could go to like three or four or send a car to each one and have three different teams if we have more funding. It really is all about the funding. It really is. Uh, that's really our main limitation is funding. Are these cars built? Like are they all just sitting in your shop right now built? Or are they, are you? Well, we, we cannibalize for the next year uh, because we are under a budget. How many of them have you got built, like, complete at one time? <clears throat> well, we have a complete one right now. We can walk over and take a look at it. Do you have more than one? Or do you have a right now, we have one complete car. Sorry, I really like this spot. Uh, we have a, a social every year, and if you get invited to the social, that's what the social is for. After the competition, we have we invite all the Baja members out, everybody, not just the ones that went to competition, but everybody. We got about maybe 40 or 50 team members uh, uh, any given year now, so we invite everybody out, and everybody gets a chance to drive the car after we've gotten back from competition, of course. How is it decided where the competition takes place? Um, well, SAE. SAE has several, a few schools that sponsor it a lot, like Auburn sponsors it quite a few, uh, quite often. 
Uh, also, I think Oregon, South Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee Tech. They, they uh, there's certain schools that that are almost set up. They have a they have a they have it all set up to, to sponsor it. So they sponsor it quite often. Uh, last year we went to El Paso. I don't know how often it's in El Paso, but uh, it really is a matter of SAE picking that school f to to be a location. It's kind of like applying to be the host of the Olympics. You know, you have to kind of uh, get SAE's approval uh, to to have their competition there, and then SAE comes and they they change the track and everything to their liking and to their safety standards and everything. So I mean, it's possible. I think in the future, for uh, UTPA or UTRGV as it will be uh, to host one of those competitions, uh, I think uh, I would feel better if we won a few competitions before we actually hosted one. So. I think uh, that's our goal right now is to just do better in the competition. And we'll ha the way we determine where we go is usually the closest one. <laughs> that's, what, that's usually what determines it is, is just the proximity. Uh, like we were, d t we were debating going to Oregon this year because the Oregon uh, uh, competition was later. It's like in mid-May or late May. And so we wouldn't have to miss class or anything like that to go to the competition. However, it was like twice the price just to get to Oregon as opposed to Alabama. And so we decided to go to Alabama, even though it meant going in the middle of the semester. Uh, the simulation program is good enough to actually tell if the design will work and how well it will work. Because if they are, if you know, considered using an evolutionary algorithm to design the vehicles automatically. Well, our simulation software works as good as any other software does as good as the operator that's using it. Uh, so you, 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 you need to use it correctly. Now, alg algorithms to design the car, <coughs> I hope that never happens uh, because that will be the end of job security for engineers in the world. But uh, I'm a designer myself, and I've, I've seen a lot of automation happen in the CAD software that I use, and it, it does a lot for you. I've seen, uh, but I've also seen what it can't do, and it can't make engineering decisions, logical decisions, and an engineer's first foremost priority is to the welfare of the public, and I find it hard to trust uh, an algorithm with that task, in, in my opinion. I think it uh, needs to have somebody overlooking it, even if you do have an algorithm designing it. What is happening is that uh, even if we do a simulation, we have to validate the simulation with experiments. So, and that's actually what the, in the competition they ask you, okay, here are your simulation, what are the results of your experiments that validate the simulation that you have? That was basically my question, was how close to real life are the simulations? Right, we try to make it as close as we can. And, and in fact, uh, there has been instances where we predict where is it gonna fail and that is exactly where it fails. <laughs> but uh, the, the idea is coming up with the right loads, coming up with the right circumstance. How, jump, how, how tall are we going to jump? How bad are we going to be crashing with other vehicles? That's hard to predict. What are going to be the forces in a, in a crash event and so forth? So we're estimating all the time. Well, that's one of the reasons why we're uh, trying to get better with atoms is because it does a lot more dynamic testing, uh, virtual testing, than what we have right now. Uh, we're using SOLIDWORKS and Al Gore. So we kind of have to set up the, the dynamic situation and see how we can set it up statically to simulate that dynamic event. But Adams actually will do it dynamically. You can set up road conditions and have the suspension tested and see what the frame sees, what forces the frame sees in a real situation uh, as opposed to kind of you know, doing the math ahead of time like we're doing right now and then plugging it into a static uh, simulation.